Hello YouTube viewers, welcome back. So uh, the other week when I was researching that for that video on the incident in the rebellion of 1745 and the Jacobite cause, I found this article on Native Americans who were supporting the Jacobite cause and it was um, an interesting article on its own. But in that article, um, I learned something I had not known before. That there were Native American, uh, in colonial times, Native Americans who were manning European ships and engaging in naval warfare. And in fact, uh, not just in the Caribbean, but off the coast of what would become New England and Canada, there were Native American pirates. So, uh, I couldn't help myself but take a moment here and to take a look at some Native American pirates. Native Americans have a long history of naval service. According to the Navy History and Heritage Command, since 1776, when George Washington began enlisting American Indians for his army, in both the Navy and the Marines, Native Americans have contributed significantly to the, to the, to the defense of the United States. During the Civil War, 20,000 served with the Union. During World War I, although ineligible for the draft, 15,000 volunteered. Uh, Native American veterans weren't awarded citizenship and voting rights until 1919. In 1924, voting rights were extended to all American Indians after the Snyder Act was passed. <clears throat> In World War II, 44,000 fought with distinction. Between 10,000 and 15,000 Native Americans fought in the Korean War, and more than 42,000 during Vietnam. As of March 2012, active duty uh, American Indian military members numbered 22,248, with over half 13,511 in the Navy. Approximately 15,000 were on active duty reserve and civilian members of the Navy's total force declared themselves uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native. But did you know there was, a, there was once a Native American Navy? Well, maybe not quite a Navy, but they did engage in a kind of naval guerrilla warfare, warfare with Europeans and colonists for a period of something like 200 years. As I stated earlier, I was reading an article about Native Americans supporting the Jacobite cause. It's actually a very interesting article, uh, and if you check out my Twitter or Facebook account, you may have seen that already posted. Anyway, this article had an interesting passage. When the Europeans did arrive, Waban Wabanki perplexity at the newcomer's mode of transportation did not last long, Native men immediately commenced a study of the foreign sailing technology and quickly became proficient in its use, so much so that it became common for Waba Wabaki crews to perform better than European ones. Sometimes through trade and sometimes through theft, the nautical Indians began to amass a substantial fleet of ocean-going vessels. So very interesting. What is a substantial fleet of ocean-going vessels exactly? Well, one of the first primary sources that I heard about was a poem in the collection Le Mousses de la Novelle France by Marc Lescarbot, mentioning what some call a Miqua fleet. <clears throat> in this poem, Lescarbot says, Thereupon there arrived twelve or fifteen boats full of savages. The verses then refer to a battle against mainland opponents in a place called Sako, uh, which is mostly in present-day Maine. Mesamusid's efforts at peaceful diplomacy had been rejected. Les Carbeau describes how, at a decisive moment in the battle, the enemy met with the forces of the valiant Mesamut, who once breathed the air of France, had learned the knowledge of warfare. And apparently that is actually a reference to the fact that his forces were using muskets, like Europeans, uh, possibly in, in ranks, even. So that's very interesting there, but let's go back to those boats. Was those 15 to 12 boats, what were those? Canoes? I found another very interesting incident here. Um, this is from another, another article which states, The first Englishman to visit Maine had quite a shock. Uh, and then it goes on to tell the story of Bartholomew Gosnold and his crew who on May 14th, 1602, made la landfall after eight weeks at sea 
in a small Dartmouth bark, the Concord. As Gonald called it, uh, he had found a land full of fair trees and a shore full of white sand, only very stony or rocky. <clears throat> Apparently they were looking out at Cape Nettick, or Cape Elizabeth, depending upon who you ask, and they were in a place that would eventually be known as New England, but not for many decades. They then encountered a vessel, what they describe as a French built by the look of it. Gosnold goes on and says, A Biscay scallop with sail and oars, manned by eight persons, whom we suppose to be Christian dressed. The captain wore a black waistcoat of English serge, breeches and cloth, European shoes and a banded hat. But once the vessel came closer, the English realized uh, the scallop's crew were actually Native Americans. <clears throat> so these people that they would come in contact were Mimac traders. Uh, they most likely spoke a kind of Basque, uh, which of course is what's spoken in uh, the Basque country, um, which is in sort of the northern part of Spain, um, in between uh, France and Spain in the Pyrenees. Uh, apparently they did understand some English. They were able to dra draw a map of the coast <clears throat> for the English explorers with a piece of chalk, and they mentioned their knowledge of Newfoundland, which was hundreds of miles to the northeast. Uh, the article says that they spoke of their encounters with Basque fishermen and said that they much desired the English to stay and trade, although they also aggressively boarded Gosnold's ship using an iron grapple in search of desirable goods. Uh, obviously they were quite versed in the European meaning of trade. These Mi'kmaq traders uh, often forced the crews to, of the ships that they captured to help them hail unsuspecting English vessels and to navigate vessels into unfamiliar harbors or simply to work as their servants. Vessels were often sold at the French fortress of Louisbourg on Cape, uh, Cape Burton Island. And so this is a part of a larger theme that we'll see here playing out where the peoples of the area, um, especially around Nova Scotia in what is now Canada, would be um, allying or using the French in a geopolitical struggle uh, against the British uh, throughout their struggle as pirates. So uh, this history is, is very extensive and I'm just going to cover a little bit here. Uh, I thought it would be it would be good to focus on some events that happened in the 1720s where over a period of two of two years the colonists especially from Boston uh, and New Hampshire pursued pursued these Native American fleets with varying degrees of success um, but first let's let's go ahead and talk about uh, one of the most famous uh, Native Americans associated with this uh, the Mi'kmaq leader Mesamut, who we already mentioned uh, in the French poem there. American historian Daniel P. Thorpe writes of Mesamut, At the turn of the 16th century, the most powerful sagamore in Acadia was probably Mesamut. Um, so this, he also stayed at the house of M. de Gramont, mayor of Bayonne, uh, and that is in the Basque region. And we know that he was there before uh, 1580, because in 1580, uh, Grand Mote dies. Uh, he seems to have learned a lot in his time. He adopted European dress. His men are described as fighting with muskets in the manner similar to Europeans, and he seems to have become obsessed with building a trade empire. Nations like Mesamut's Mi'kmaq and the, especially the Wabanaki <coughs> would become engaged in a geopolitical struggle to block England's efforts to create a transatlantic mercantile empire. According to Matthew, uh, Matthew R. Bahar, an assistant professor of history at Oberlin College in Ohio, quote, it was a threat to jeopardize Britain's campaign for a colonial ascendancy in the 18th century. The inability of Britain to muster resources to deal with this problem allows the Wabanaki to advance their own agenda in, Northwest, in the Northwest Atlantic. <coughs> uh, so to put some numbers on it, according to Professor Bahar, some 20 fishing catches were captured during King Philip's War, and at what point during King William's War, which was um, from 1688 to 1697, an Indian-held schooner and catch fired cannon at a fishing vessel in York Harbor, forcing it to surrender. 15 to 16 more fishing vessels were taken by Penobscots at the opening of Drummer's War in 1724. 
including two schooners they used for seal hunting at Grand Man. That in a little bit of context, uh, as you can see from that flyer that was up previously with all the ships, uh, the fishing ships were obviously pretty small. Uh, the sloops were also relatively pretty small. Uh, the largest of ships were kind of the, the scallop, which was still not, not at all the warship with having multiple cannons or anything like that, but they were capturing numbers of ships. So speaking of 1724, uh, let's get back to these um, events. So the, the way that this worked was <clears throat> the Native Americans would, would uh, sneak, basically most of the time sneak up on fishermen as, and then kind of steal their, their ships, use those smaller ships to then get onto bigger ships. As Bahar writes, uh, they started early with scallops, which were kind of training wheels for the Indians wanting to use European sailing vessels. Once they became proficient with these, they moved up to fishing sloops and catches and schooners, but that seems to have been the end of their upgrading. Uh, he also writes that crews coming back from, Euro from Caribbean voyages reported being met at sea by craft, that Indians sailed mounting swivel guns, and the Braves were eager to, eager to close with the white men. So even uh, people coming back from the Caribbean were running into basically Native American pirates captaining their own ships and crewing, crewing their own ships. By the middle of June 1724, Indian sea fighters from the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, and Biotuk tribes had taken 11 fishing vessels with a total complement of 45 men, of which 22 were killed in combat and 23 were made prisoner. Ships and men were held for ransom and the Indians stated their terms 50 pounds for uh, a vessel and 30 pounds for each of the men. <clears throat> the colonists at, Bo at Boston did not take this lying down. They outfitted two ships with crews of 25 men each. Then they were sent out to the eastward and were to make rendezvous with, the two, strongly, with two other strongly armed ships from New Hampshire. The New Hampshire ships carried crews of 20 men apiece as well. But on the 13th of July there was news that an Indian man schooner had seized the scallop and possibly other vessels. The Boston fishermen talked of pursuit of the schooner, but no one actually left the harbor. So they were scared enough uh, of Native Americans that they, they didn't even actually leave with the safety of Boston Harbor. Two more ships were sent out uh, from Maine at this time, one schooner captained by a Dr. George Jackson and a scallop captained by one Sylvester Lakeman. Each had a crew of 20 men. Somewhere off of Penobscot, the two ships met a schooner manned by Native Americans. It was armed with two swivel guns. Jackson had the larger ship and he attempted uh, to intercept the native schooner. As the ships approached, the Indian commander came around and ran across Jackson's bow at, a cl at close range. This was the classical battle maneuver and, cl and flawlessly executed. While the native craft leaned to the wind, her gunners opened fire with the swivel guns. The round shot took out the main sheet and the shrouds of Jackson's schooner. The main mast uh, got snapped. Indian musketeers were firing into the colonial, uh, into the colonial crew, and a, and a sharpshooter actually struck um, Jackson's mate with a with a musket ball. So that, that must have been a pretty good shot. Sailing past the floundering schooner, the Indian commander rounded up and went on an inshore course. The Indian vessel was last seen as she sailed swiftly into the upper reaches of Penobscot Bay, <clears throat> and that would be kind of a a theme you'd see here. Harold Prins and Arthur. Our anthropologist at Kansas State University summarized this as, quote, thus are very specific adaptions for their environment, like the Apache with their Mustangs or the Tareg of Northern Africa with their camels. The canoe is a fantastic vehicle for taking around a waterfall or over a sandbar, and it lent itself to the hit and run tactics that you see the Wabanaki use in their conflicts with the, in with the English. <coughs> So unable to win at sea, the colonists began burning Native American settlements the length of the northern coast, thus destroying their food sources. Uh, this was coupled with the fact that the Native fleet did not have a harbor to refit at. Fit at. They didn't have any shipyards. Uh, they relied on trade or plunder to keep supplied, and the attacks um, diminished this over time. So basically, the colonists would engage in a war of attrition. The Natives couldn't just get get general supplies to refit their boats. Um, a fisherman James, named James Marsh gave word on July 6th, 1725, that his fishing fleet was attacked off of Cape, ne Cape Negro 
uh, on Nova Scotia. Um, he said there were 100 warriors in a canoe assault and that they took five of his ships and imprisoned the crews. The, uh, then they took those ships that they had just um, captured and turned them around to presume, pursue Marsh himself. He stated that he escaped them only because of the head start that he had gotten while they were transferring themselves to the new, to new vessels. Uh, this would turn out to be one of the last reported events. Um, eventually, these tribes were pushed further, further into northern Canada, as we uh, already said, because of the uh, war of attrition that was going on. Um, and actually, after the outbreak of the Golden Age of Piracy in the Caribbean, um, British officials began referring to Indians uh, in this area as well as pirates. And in 1726, three, re three were hung for piracy in Boston. Um, after an unsuccessful attempt to hijack a, ves a vessel again uh, off of um, Cape Negro in, in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> of this time period, um, Matthew Bahar, uh, Professor Matthew Bahar, again writes, Indians were consistently the, were contesting the British efforts to integrate the Atlantic into a seamless economy. They weren't trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Royal Navy, but by targeting the fishery, they were taking on a cornerstone of the British Atlantic trade and economy. So again, not, not big naval battles, but um, just a, a few little attacks here and there to try and survive, break into the economy, and make their own. Uh, eventually, that wouldn't really work out. Uh, people even like Mesa Muset would die um, in 1610 of, of disease, and his tribe actually was eventually pretty early on pushed inland as well. So there you have it, Native American t pirates terrorizing Yankees, those Bostonians before they were even Yankees. Uh, hope you enjoyed that little video, and uh, we'll see you next time.